this is Hey guys, this is Pete on the beat. In this video, I'll present to you an essay in which I'm sharing with you my story of heavy drug and alcohol abuse. The essay includes some personal stuff in very deep details, real life stories and things and lessons I've learned based on my past and lifetime experiences. So with that being said, let's begin. During my late childhood and whole puberty, I never really liked nor loved myself, not even for a single moment. Even though I was trying to hide it and often was playing it tough on the outside, back then I was full of inferiority complexes and always felt very insecure and uncomfortable in my own skin. The way I would describe it is like having self-doubt even when I had to go to the toilet. I knew I had to do something about it but wasn't sure what exactly, so I started messing with drugs. No, I ain't some kind of innocent angel nor a perfect person who got into the self-improvement right after taking his first breath in the moment of his birth. It is not even close to that. Actually, for quite a while I was walking down the path towards self-destruction and I was doing it with very big steps. This post is dedicated to the people who can relate to that. My main goal with it is to show and prove to them that regardless of how bad their situations currently are and despite of what the others may say to them, the change is possible and it's never too early nor too late for it. In the end of the day, since I've made it, they would probably do much better than me in a lot less time. True to be told, I always wanted to share that story with someone, but I never had the proper person nor group of people to do so, yet I always knew that no one could be better than you guys. I simply needed some better language skills, which I hope now I have, some courage and the proper inspiration. And as long as for the last two, I believe that the feedback I recently got under my 4 years of no fuck experience video provided both of them, so here we go. So in this video guys, I'll share with you my 10 years experience of drug usage and my story of having multiple addictions or abusing the shit out of multiple substances. I'll also reveal to you how I quit all of them and how I managed to not even touch any of those substances for close to a decade. The reason why I'm saying close to and not a whole decade is because the period actually vary for each of the substances I was using. While for some it's more like eight and a half to nine years or nine and a half for others is even more than 10. Yes, I developed all of those addictions or I started abusing the shit out of all of those substances at different age, but during certain periods of my life, those addictions were overlapping with each other. The way I'm going to proceed now, guys, is by giving you a little summary of the story I had with every one of those substances. The easier for me overcoming a particular addiction was, the less I would talk about the substance and the more in the beginning of the video I would talk about it. The more I was into a specific drug, the more in depth I'll get when talking about it and also the more in the end of the video I'll talk about that one. The chronological order partly represents what was happening in my life as the time was passing by. It also reflects to how strong in terms of addictiveness each of those drugs was to me. So now guys, let's begin by naming all of the substances I've ever used and then let's make clear to which of them I had some form of an addiction which I had to somehow overcome. Cigarettes, marijuana, alcohol, speed, molly and two types of hallucinogenic mushrooms. While the last two I used not more than total of 10 times each, to all of the others I had some form of an addiction which I had to fight and eventually overcome. Everything started with cigarette smoking. In third grade, 10 or 9 years old, me and the boy with whom we were quote unquote best friends started smoking cigarettes. For a while it was boosting my self esteem and it was also making me feel better about myself. Honestly, I thought that the smoking was awesome. You light a cigarette, you hold it as it burns and you get to blow smoke. Pretty awesome, huh? Or how it couldn't be since my beloved grandma and all of the cool kids I knew back then were doing it. Yet, that was not all. The fact it was prohibited in school was also massively contributing to see the habit as something exceptionally appealing because I despised school since the first day I stepped in it. 
As long as I can remember, my friend copied the habit from his older brother who was kind of a big deal amongst the teenagers and he was also a bully. First time I smoked cigarettes, I do not have exact memory when that thing happened, but I'm pretty sure it happened in school. Very soon, me and my homie started collecting our money and we were buying a pack of cigarettes and plenty of chewing gum every single day. Just in case you wonder, we were using the chewing gum after smoking so we could smell less to our parents and to the other adults. Our thing was to hide ourselves in one unfinished building which supposed to be a swimming pool and it was technically part of the local high school. Yet they never finished it so it was still there after close to two years when I was searching for a proper place to lose my virginity. As the time passed by I stopped hiding myself and very soon I was smoking cigarettes all day every day on all sorts of places. Meanwhile in fifth grade I visited hospital twice in the toxicology because I also started messing with alcohol. Meanwhile. How bad my smoking addiction got. Now fast forward to the times when I was between 16 and 19 years old. Back then things were nowhere near as fun as they were in the beginning. I've reached the point where I was already smoking up to two packs a day on my own. My cravings for nicotine were so strong that after I was done with mine, I was always smoking other people's cigarettes. Those were my mom's cigarettes, my friend's cigarettes, basically the cigarettes of all of the people around me. Probably you expected that, but I'm pretty sure you do not expect the thing that I'm about to share with you now. I was often collecting cigarette butts not only from ashtrays but also from the streets. No, I haven't smoked them. What I was doing was to pull out the tobacco and make a new cigarette by using rolling paper. The breaking point, what made me quit smoking and how I've done that. It was the fall of 2007. Back then I not only had an awful coat but my sputter had an abnormal brown color. Huffing and puffing pretty much 24-7, even the smallest physical activities were making me breathe a lot harder and on top of everything I was also sweating like a motherfucker. Spending up to 2 minutes expectorating and doing it several times during the course of the day was a, such a common thing to me back then. Sometimes intimate contacts were not only unpleasant but also very embarrassing. I was breathing and sweating so heavy that when I was on top of my partners my sweat was dropping on their faces. Some of the girls were stopping the act and bringing some extra sheets or even a towel in bed in order to get rid of all of that sweat. One day while I was sleeping my friends woke me up. Scared they were concerned I was about to choke while sleeping because my lungs and whole breathing have been making some very uncommon sounds. Probably the same month if not even the same week after hearing my cough, another person said to me if you don't stop smoking you choke up in your own sauce. At that point I already hated cigarettes and I was also planning to quit them for quite a while. Now I had multiple serious reasons to do so. My first reason was my health. That included all the horror thoughts I had back then in my head that my body was probably also seriously damaged because of the stuff I did to myself during the previous years and especially during the past summer and past spring. The summer and spring of 2007. If you watch the whole video you'll find out exactly what I mean. The second reason was the fact that I knew I had to somehow start dealing with my heavy alcohol addiction which back then was actually getting stronger. I knew my willpower was weak as fuck therefore I had to conserve it for the most urgent things. My third reason was my plan to make my mama quit smoking too. My fourth reason was the fact that smoking was interfering my scratch practices which back then were just getting longer and more frequent. That was actually the period of my life when I started getting really serious with scratching. And my last reason was the fact that I was no longer willing to spend money on cigarettes.
Now, how I quit smoking. Back then, all of the people around me, probably 99% of the people around me, including my mom and that girl I was constantly convincing to fuck me, were smokers. Regardless of that, after close to 9 years of doing it, I quit smoking for one day. In the next 2 years, I made both of them do the same and, as long as I know, my mom still doesn't smoke and I'm extremely proud of that thing, true to be told. And right now guys, I will share with you a little cool fact that is actually related to the whole story. Mom told me that I was like her father or I reminded her of her father. So that guy also quit smoking for one day after being a smoker for so many years. R.I.P. to him. Now, my take on the addiction to tobacco and cigarette smoking. To me, cigarettes are the most stupid drug I've ever tried. The dumbest or the most stupid drug I've ever tried. Hands down. There is no high nor mental or physical rush whatsoever. Nothing happens when you smoke a cigarette. So why the fuck you're smoking for? To choke yourself up and end up in a situation where you're huffing and puffing 24-7. Or to smell like crap, get lung cancer and not be able to sense all the smells and tastes that are available in our world. I think shit is boring as fuck, honestly. And plus that, 90s are long gone. So, okay guys, now it's time to move to the second substance and that was basically weed, aka reefer, aka pot, aka marijuana. There are plenty of names to choose from. Heavily influenced by the hip-hop culture and mostly listening to rap music, I always used to believe that pot was some form of a social slash cultural type of a drug. Honestly, for quite a while I thought that weed was a very important part of the whole lifestyle and culture. Despite that it never worked for me in that manner, I also thought that pot was a magical thing I could possibly use to boost creativity and inspiration. Side note, hip-hop definitely made me try weed, but it wasn't the reason for the development of my addiction. My stupidity was. I really want to make that thing clear. When I was in 6th grade, I started smoking weed occasionally. It was making me laugh and for quite a while I was really fucking with it. Because of that I was smoking pretty much every time I had the chance to do so. I was also very excited about all of those times because back then they were fairly rare. I mean that wasn't happening on the day to day basis, probably it wasn't even happening every week. How bad my weed addiction got. Now, let's scroll to the times when I was in 8th grade. At that point, I was already spending all of my money on weed and I was smoking all day, every day, or until there was nothing left. Me and the people with whom I was hanging with were collecting our money so we could buy and smoke more weed. Even though I was no longer excited about it, at that point I could not even imagine my life without it. It was simply part of my day. Pretty much obsessed with it, getting my hands on it was something like my daily priority. Something like a daily mission type of a thing, if you will. I even had periods when I was starting my mornings with a doobie previously rolled on the night before. At that point, I was no longer getting high, it was no longer making me laugh, I was simply getting stoned as a motherfucker. Meanwhile, I got beaten and locked up by the police because of few ounces of weed I had in my pocket for personal use. Some of my closest friends had similar fate. I became very paranoid and also extremely anxious, but for some weird reason, me and the people around me used to believe that it was only the paranoia, because the paranoia was one of the most common side effects of the weed smoking. But later in my life, I realized that back then I was actually getting some massive panic attacks on a day-to-day -day basis. So, it wasn't only the paranoia, it was a combination of paranoia and a lot of anxiety. After smoking, I was getting very lazy, tired, but in long term, it was actually making me more aggressive. I was arguing about everything with everyone and ultimately, I was definitely losing my sense of self-preservation. Certainly not the person you would want to be around, I was a total jerk and it had a lot to do with my weed smoking. Did I mention that it was also making me dreamless and emotionless? 
I guess the best way of describing it is to say that I became so dumb and narrow-minded that I was not even aware of it to the point where it was jeopardizing my whole life and well-being. And I wasn't aware of that either. I was also blind to see that I was hanging with the wrong company, some of the people with whom I was hanging with really did not belong to my wife and I had to remove them immediately. Not taking care of myself nor of my stuff was such a common thing to me during my weed smoking days. Probably in 99% of the time my room was a total mess and on top of everything I was rocking fairly long hair and a beard. Something I would never do unless I'm out of my mind. Can you even imagine how ridiculous my face looks with a fucking long hair and a beard? And here I would like to make clear that I'm not against hipsters, I'm not against people who prefer to rock that haircut or that style in general. It's simply not the proper one for my face, okay? Apart from those side effects, I also became as stupid as you can imagine, if not even more. Probably the best way of describing it is to say that I became brain dead. My long and short term memory were so altered that I was barely able to remember anything. And now guys, pay attention to the thing that I'm about to say, because it is weird as fuck, okay? The person with whom I was smoking with most of the time had the same exact issues going. Very often we were discussing the same things over and over again like it was for the first time, like they were totally new to both of us. So what was happening was that person was coming to me on a specific day and he was telling me something for example and after one or two days both of us were completely forgetting about that thing and after those one or two days I was telling that person the same exact thing he told me one or two days ago and we were discussing it like it was brand new to both of us like we were discussing it for the first time and eventually after a while one was telling to the other probably we are not discussing that thing for the first time and that thing was basically happening pretty much all the time I also began having some extreme difficulties in school. No, I never really cared about my grades, yet that immediately changed in the moment when I had to study during the whole summer vacation so I could somehow get at least E- minus in order to not repeat the whole previous year in school. On top of everything that happened twice and both times I struggled massively. Reefer was also triggering some unbearable cravings for carbohydrates and other sugary foods. I was always going with some double chocolate chip cookies. When stoned, those cookies were probably my all-time favorite thing to eat and to a very big extent they were actually part of my whole smoking ritual. But very often I was not able to afford the cookies due to the fact I've already spent all of my money on wheat or wheat and cigarettes. So in that scenario I was buying me some plain bread and I was stuffing my face with plain bread because after smoking I was starving to death and I was craving a lot of carbohydrates, basically foods higher in carbohydrates, sugary foods and all of that stuff. Here I would like to make clear that based on the knowledge that I have nowadays, honestly I do not believe that was only because of weed. I do not believe the weed by itself was the main cause of all of those cravings. I am pretty sure the cravings were already there because of my shitty dad and weed was simply amplifying them to the maximum. Dating and intimate contacts were total no-no on weed because weed was making my shyness and insecurities stronger. It was amplifying them as well. As a conclusion, I will say that weed was turning me into very unproductive, unfocused, shy, confidence fucking and completely not interested in achieving any form of success nor in making any kind of progress piece of shit. Please don't get me wrong, this is just my personal opinion about the way weed worked for me. It is based on close to 4 years of experience with weed. It is just how I feel about the results I was getting when I was smoking it or using it in general. 
Now the breaking point, how I quit with it and what were the things which made me do that. There was no breaking point with this one. Regardless of how strong my addiction was, I really had no difficulties when I was quitting with it. I've not only entirely lost my interest in it, but hating it with passion became essential to me. And in a moment or in the second part of this video, you will find out what was the exact thing which massively contributed to that. It took me close to two months to quit with and Entirely. After that period, I smoked several times, I believe they were close to 5 times. Each of those times reminded me why exactly I quit weed and after that I never touched it again. So here guys I would like to do this disclaimer because I want to say two things that are related to marijuana before I move to the other substances. First of all I want to make clear that I'm not against the people who use marijuana for medical purposes by any means. The second thing that I would like to make clear is the fact that based on my observations and based on the experience I have with marijuana close to 4 years of experience, I believe only very few people have that genetic predisposition to really get high, to really experience the feel which most of the rappers describe in their songs. I also believe that most of the people get stoned and not high and they are not quitting with for the simple reason they are too addicted to it, ok? That is again just my personal opinion. So, before I move to the other substances guys, I will share with you three real life stories and the last is actually not really a story but more like a bunch of facts brought together. All of those stories, they are from that period and I believe it was the right thing to share them with you but you can also skip to the next parts of the video if you want. Let's begin with the first one. As a kid growing up, I was fucking with graffiti. I was not doing some exceptionally difficult pieces, but I was fucking with a lot of tags, throw-ups, bombs, and I had something like a crew. We were calling ourselves Fuck the School. That was basically the name of the crew. And instead of bombing trains or walls in downtown, we were mostly bombing walls in our neighborhood and also some schools. What I did one day was to write Fuck the School on my forearm with a fucking razor blade right here. No, I do not have any scars to show you guys, but I really wanted to share that story with you because it was part of that period as well. The name fuck the school popped into my head not only because of the way how I felt about school, but because of a specific song of NWA. I'm pretty sure all of you know the name of the song. And because of the legendary French, but I believe it's legendary European rap crew NTM. Just in case you don't know, NTM stands for Nick Tamer, and you can google what Nick Tamer actually means. So those were the primary sources of inspiration for that name. Now guys, I'll tell you the second story, but this one is very sad actually, so keep that in mind. As long as I can remember, that whole thing happened several months after I got beaten and walked by a few police officers. When I was in 9th grade, the school principal called me and one of my homies rolling weed in between the classes. She called the cops, but due to the fact that my homie told them that the weed was all his and that I had nothing to do with it, they walked only him. Being busy and strict taking care of important things like stopping us from smoking weed in between the classes, the principal did not even try to do something in order to prevent the homicide which later happened in the area of her school. Same one was done by 32 year old Nazi oriented male who was 8th grader at the same school and not once blackmailed me for money. Probably only God knows how many times that Nazi oriented person repeated 8th grade. The school principal also never made any attempts to prevent all of those times when that person blackmailed me for money. And here I would like to point out that being blackmailed or being bullied by older Nazi kids because of the music in which I was interested in, because of the way I used to dress back then, was definitely not something new to me. But the fact that that person was 32 year old male was scaring the shit out of me, okay? It was certainly elevating the levels of my anxiety and fear 
drastically. 15 or 16 years old, the victim was also a student at the same school and I actually knew him barely. I mean, I talked to him several times when I was also a student at the same school. So yeah guys, that was the second story and now we are going to move to the third and final story of that period. So, because I really don't know how to tell you all the things that I'm about to tell you, I will simply say them, okay? So, I already told you about that unfinished building in which I was hiding myself most of the time when I started smoking cigarettes. In the same place, I also got drunk numerous times, but specifically those two times in fifth grade when I had to visit the hospital in the toxicology. That was the place where I smoked a lot of weed and that was also the place where a person with whom I was hanging with got locked in front of my eyes for marijuana. And finally, that was the place where I had sex for the first time and where I did speed for the first time. And as long as for the last two, both of them actually happened on the exact same table for table tennis in that unfinished building okay and just in case you wonder yes i had sex for the first time on a table for table tennis in one unfinished building in my neighborhood honestly i believe that those were just too many coincidences in that whole thing and i really wanted to share it with you as well so yeah that was the end of the third story that was really not a story actually so, okay guys, now I'll move to the two substances I've tried, but to which I was never addicted to. And the main reason why I decided to put both of them in the middle of the video is because I'm partly obsessed with symmetry and I believe that that will bring some symmetry to the whole structure of the video. I hope you will understand that. So, the first time I did Molly, it was during the winter between 2005 and 2006. The number of times I did Molly does not exceed the total of 5. What I can remember is that I never popped a whole point. I popped a half and the other half was for the person who was with me back then. The feel it was giving me partly reminded me the feel I was getting from speed, but it was like 10 times weaker and it was hitting me in cyclical manner. There was some form of a build-up, but again it was in cyclical manner. There was some euphoria, but it was a lot weaker. True to be told, all of those times I was expecting to get extremely impressed, mostly because of what all of the people around me back then told me, that the active ingredient of the molly, that is the MDMA aka methylene dioxymethamphetamine, was 100 times better than speed but it never worked for me in that manner. I already had my drug of choice. When I did Molly, I simply found that Molly wasn't my drug of choice and never became my drug of choice. And actually the only reason why I tried Molly at all was because my drug of choice was not available in those moments. Finally, it was also giving me a very weird and annoying feel at the back of my tongue or at the back of my mouth. I never started liking it, I never started fucking with it, okay? That was basically all. Now we are going to move to the second substance I've tried, but to which I was never addicted. Mushrooms, hallucinogenic mushrooms, magic mushrooms, shrooms, plenty of names to choose from. First time I did mushrooms, I really can't remember when that thing happened, but I'm pretty sure it was between 2004 and 2005 or 2006. I guess back then I did plenty of things for the first time. I tried two types of hallucinogenic mushrooms. The number of times I ate both of them does not exceed the total of eight. As long as I know the first one are made in something like laboratory and they are called cubensis or cubensis psilocybe or cabensis psilocybe. I'm not so sure how to pronounce the name, so if you really want to, feel free to correct me, but I really don't care, actually. The second type, again, as long as I know, are called only psilocybe or psilocybe. Differently from the others, those were not made in laboratory. I would say that all the experiences I had on mushrooms were very impressive, but I couldn't imagine even back then, during my worst period, to do mushrooms frequently. I was completely aware that shrooms were definitely not the substance I would want to mess with often. Obviously because of their incredible toxicity. Actually, that was the most toxic substance I've ever tried. 
The second reason was because I never became a psychedelic type of a guy. I never became a fan of psychedelics or hallucinogens. What happened? It is pretty simple. I simply wasn't able to stop laughing for hours straight. I was continuing beyond the point where my eyes were already dry and where my stomach was already hurting, I simply couldn't stop laughing. The other thing was that staring at different things and objects for uncommonly prolonged periods of time felt extremely essential. Just in case you wonder, I never had any form of visual hallucinations. I was simply laughing at all of the things you can possibly imagine. For example, the buildings, the people, the whole city, the trees in the local park. Everything seemed so funny to me. Apart from those things, shrooms were also raising my appetite. One of the times I binged on Ren and Stimpy and I also ate everything that was inside my fridge that night. So, okay guys, that was basically all I had to say as long as for my experiences with both of those substances. Now it's time to move to the heavier stuff. Speed aka amphetamine. I'm not saying meth because I never ever fucked with crystals. Not even for a single time. Okay? Keep that in mind. It was the end of the summer vacation between 8th and 9th grade. All of the people with whom I was smoking with were out of town. The only person who I knew was in town was a girl to whom we were giving money to buy a sweet. I'm not so sure if that girl had something like a crush on me, but for the most part she definitely wanted to fuck me. Most of the time on my behalf I was avoiding talking to her if it wasn't about weed or about things related to weed. For some reason I was simply not fucking with her energy and I also felt that she wasn't down enough with the culture. Or she was a fake one, something like that. Pretty much all of the times when the girl was talking to me she was finding a way to mention that speed was lit as fuck because she was already fucking with speed and that accordingly to her I was the exact kind of a guy to do speed and because of that I did not have to shy away from it. Side note, back then I had the mentality that if something was natural, for example like tobacco or weed, then it was great, but on the other hand if something was artificially created or even synthetic, then it was bad, so I wanted to stay away from it by any means. Studying during the entire summer not only bored me to death, but also got me very mad to the whole world. On top of everything, that was happening for the second time. Hating many things, including my own self, back then I felt so uninterested in life. My complexes and self-doubt were stronger than ever and I looked obnoxiously worthless in my own eyes. Honestly, I felt like it couldn't get any worse than that. So, the biggest part of the reason why I felt like that back then was because of some family-related issues and some episodes of my wife when I was in a situation where I had to deal with the same exact issues. Actually, I'm not ready to talk about that thing, but if I don't share that thing with you, you're never gonna be able to find out why this exact substance became my favorite. So the episodes I'm talking about, they included me and the person who happens to be my other biological parent and is also very abusive and arrogant person. So the way I felt about those episodes or those memories was that they marked my person I guess we can call that I felt like they damaged me on a spiritual level, they affected my soul, they gave me some like spiritual scar and I felt like my personality has been marked forever. Just in case you wonder, all those episodes, they basically happened way before I started smoking cigarettes, way before I started drinking alcohol, way before I started messing with drugs, okay, weed including. I was very very little kid. But the weirdest thing was the fact that I used to believe that most of the people either knew about that thing or they were able to sense it when talking to me or when looking into my eyes. And on top of everything I also used to believe that girls were able to sense it better than males due to their female intuition. Women in general, I thought that they were able to sense or notice that thing way better than males due to their female intuition, okay? Now it sounds very funny, but back then it wasn't funny at all. I was like 16 years old. The second part of the reason why I felt like that back then was because of some kids 
who in my eyes had it all figured out and they were all about flexing on me okay back then me and those kids we were hanging with each other and we were basically all about battling each other in order to prove ourselves that the one was better than the other and because they were able to afford gear and i was not able to afford gear they were all about stealing my dreams and turning them into reality in front of my eyes. I had massive anxiety about that thing. Side note, back then I was messing with a little bit of graffiti, mostly tucks, throw-ups and sketches. I was making audio post tapes. I did not have a computer and I was also spitting a little bit of bars. No, it wasn't in English, so it really doesn't count. I do not spit bars and the only reason why I'm bringing this is to help you develop a better idea exactly how I felt the first time when I took the substance. So that summer, the girl I told you about accomplished two of her goals. First time, nothing happened. Second time, as long as I can remember, nothing happened. While waiting to get high, stoned, drunk or maybe to experience all, none of them actually happened. A completely new and different field took me over. It was a combination of many things which until back then I couldn't even imagine a particular drug could cause. There was an emotional buildup and very strong mental and physical rush which were reflecting as goosebumps all over my body. But back then I was calling those goosebumps waves. The goosebumps or the waves were representations of all of my thoughts and actions. Do you remember how I started the post and what I described as an end result of my weed smoking? In a blink of an eye, all of my inferiority complexes were gone and I no longer felt like my personality was marked, damaged or altered. I was no longer lacking confidence, regardless that I wasn't understanding it at first, I actually had excessive amounts of it. I also realized that my thought process became 20 times faster. The girl always wanted to hear me spitting bars. For months she was asking me to do it before her. Yet I really did not want to do it partly because I felt a bit shy and partly because I thought she was a fake one or because I felt she wasn't down enough with the culture. This time things were different. Probably I was different. She asked me and I immediately accepted. While doing it was the time when I started noticing the strong confidence boost I was actually getting. It didn't take too long for me to realize that I was able to say whatever the fuck I wanted to say in that moment in rhymes and I was also able to continue as long as I wanted. Actually I felt very powerful and also free. There were no insecurities nor shyness whatsoever. After I was done she told me that what I did was incredible and that I was the shit. The way her words made me feel became the first part of the reason why I got hooked on it. I mean I already certainly felt like I was the Shit, but that recognition took the field to a whole different level. And that recognition or verification, depends on how we prefer to call it, later became one of the things I was craving the most, okay? But I'm talking about that thing later in the video. Then I felt like I was ready to do something or like I was chosen for it. At that point I had no idea what but deep inside me I knew I had some unique destiny to fulfill. Looking into my soul triggered all sorts of fantasies about scratching, battling and making beats that partly provided the answer of my question. By talking to my company I found that I was actually able to understand her better than ever, probably 100 times better. Engaged in the conversation like never before, I was sharing my dreams and parts of my life story in very deep details. I got very compassionate, emotional and empathetic about pretty much everything, but most importantly about my own self. Limitations no longer existed, a few very close to the one I had most of the time before I started going to school. Only even thinking about it brought back my interest in life just in few moments. All the happiness in the world was waiting for me to experience it, but the key to it was deeply hidden somewhere inside me. That was a thought which came to my head in those moments, just in case you wonder. Partly because I felt my whole being was craving it for years and partly because I finally found it, I couldn't handle the emotions and I cried. 
no sobbing nor noises whatsoever just some tears on my cheeks the whole thing i would describe as an emotional orgasm slash ejaculation yes it was in front of her she never found what the reason was but later she didn't miss to tell some other kids so they could make fun of me. Expecting that, the girl's actions were not concerning me at all. I felt like from now on, from that moment back then, there was nothing I should worry about. Like all of my insecurities, doubts, school and family related issues no longer existed. No, it wasn't like I stopped caring about those things. It was more like they weren't there. I felt untouchable and I knew that those things would never prevent me from feeling this way again. It was almost like something or someone promised me that in a very convincing way deep inside me. While 15 minutes ago I felt like I had zero chances against the kids with whom we were battling each other, now they were no longer a threat to me. And that whole thing that they were about stealing my dreams and doing better in the things that I wanted to achieve sounded as a total joke in my head. That thing along with all of my other fears was simply no longer making sense to me. To a very big extent I felt like I was some kind of an unfuckwittable, unkillable soul. Of course that also played huge role when I was getting hooked on it. All of the inspiration, creativity and dreams rappers were saying weed was giving to them, it never gave to me. The amphetamine on the other hand was providing that was so much more. Even though for quite a while I really did not want to admit them, two things were for sure. Number one, I was in love with it. Number two, that was the beginning of the end of my weed addiction or weed smoking, whatever you prefer to call it. How bad my addiction or heavy abuse got. In the middle of 2005 they introduced me to some Swedish kid who was really fucking with me and he started hanging with me almost immediately. Basically we clicked with each other almost immediately. It happened that me and him were sharing some painful but very similar experiences. Based on the things he shared with me I assumed that his personality was marked too. At that point both of us were still smoking pot but because of obvious reasons we were no longer fucking with it. After taking a lot of speed me and that guy were talking about our wife stories, our dreams and aspirations and also about some girls we were dating back then. Always together he was watching for people while I was doing graffiti tags in downtown during the middle portion of the day. Now fast forward to the times between the summer and spring of 2007. During that period of time my addiction reached its peak. Apart from that, the stuff I was taking back then was so much stronger than everything else I used before. While the effects of the previous one started decreasing only after one week of intense usage, with the thing I'm talking about, that barely started happening in the end of the summer. And keep in mind that I was doing it frequently during the winter, I was doing it at least several days a week during the spring, and during the summer I was doing it almost every single day. It was the whole summer straight. It was making me way more emotional and insanely driven to do or say whatever was on my mind, but in the same way to think a lot before doing or saying something stupid. I was feeling like I was the shit. That was the most important thing. I adored my version when I was on it. Most of the people around me felt the exact same way about me when I was on it. Incredibly happy with the results I was getting, I had to have it almost by any means. So based on the research I did later in my life and based on the things I've read on Reddit and on drugs.org, I would say that the feel I was getting from that substance was extremely close to the feel most people get from vibrance, okay? Like that type of a feel but 100 times stronger, something like that. And here guys, I will share something with you that no one actually knows about me. That is probably the first time I'm sharing that thing with someone openly. So I already told you about that emotional orgasm slash ejaculation type of a thing I experienced some of the first times I did speed. Okay? So pay attention to the thing that I'm about to say now. After a while crying on it became something I was actually enjoying and even waiting for. No, it wasn't during the depression phase but during the actual high. And as long as for the depression phase we are going to cover that thing in a moment. Shedding some tears was some kind of a verification that the substance was good enough. 
And right now I will explain you exactly how I felt during those moments of crying. Because it wasn't sadness, it wasn't really only a happiness. Basically it felt like my whole being was paying homage to the drug itself and to the climax of emotions I was experiencing. Like something was dissolving in my soul, a chemical reaction after which I couldn't prevent me from crying because of how incredible about myself I felt. And when I felt that that thing was about to happen, I was pretending that I have to go to the toilet, okay? because I was hiding my tears from my other crewmates. But I guess I wasn't the only one because several times I noticed the same responses on the faces of some of my friends. Side note, in order to not look soft nor funny in my own eyes and those of the other kids, I was purposely avoiding being emotional by any means. This is where things started getting serious. I felt like everywhere I was failing or underperforming, my other me was succeeding. That included dating, social life, school and even family. I started dating some girls who were way more attractive as females than I was as male. Some of my closest friends almost had crushes on them and that was making me feel like I was the shit even more. Until the period I'm talking about, I was never a cool kid, yet that immediately changed and I quickly became a barometer of what cool actually was and I also started hanging with a different crew. In fact, I formed my own crew and I was fucking only with them while completely ignoring the others. I still hated school, but I was pretty much fine with it as long as I was on speed. I also started having better grades. It was like school no longer mattered. In fact, nothing really mattered as long as I knew that at some point during the day or during the course of the week, I would become my other version. My family never approved the people with whom I was hanging with during my weed smoking days. They were seeing what my stupidity never allowed me to sense. The fact that those so-called friendships had an extremely negative impact on my whole life and well-being. It did not take too long and the people I'm talking about were no longer part of my life. Firstly because I finally understood that they were toxic as fuck and secondly because weed was no longer my drug of choice. My family never found that there were actually two reasons for that but they really liked the results. How I felt back then was that Stoners were too slow and indecisive to hang with me, therefore I did not want any of them as entourage. Weed already seemed as a joke, like they never existed before, my cravings for it simply weren't there. On a very rare occasions I was hitting a joint here and there, but it wasn't making any difference when I was already high on speed. I began shaving my whole body and I also started to clean and to take care of my stuff. Actually very often I was not able to stop cleaning. Like there was no living without it, at that point I was already spending all of my money on speed. It was my key to life or maybe even more, my breathing mask, so no matter what I had to have it. After entirely losing interest in being the person I was when off of it, I started avoiding him by any means. At that point I also already knew what was waiting for me if I stopped. Slowly but surely the depression was creeping out and no, I was not willing to deal with it, not today, not tomorrow and certainly not any other day of that summer. I was too fly for that and I felt like I was on some next level shit, I was on some other shit. Almost every single week that summer I was skipping 2-3 days of sleeping and eating. And no, back then I had no idea of what the intermittent fasting was, I had no idea what the sleep reduction protocols were, it was a completely different situation. Meanwhile the high was getting weaker and weaker and the side effects were becoming way more pronounced. Ultimately I've reached the point where I had to take so much more than I was previously taking just to get the results which were satisfying me. In order to maintain being my other version I also had to take it more and more frequently. After that, not taking it for close to 5 hours equaled the afterward effects. And right now we are going to discuss what the afterward effects were. So far so great, now let's cover what was happening every time after I was doing speed. All of my insecurities, fears and doubts were coming back at me now at least 10 times stronger. A feel of extremely deep depression 
was taking over me. No, there wasn't any anxiety in terms of panic attacks or something similar. Just a lot of desperation, sadness, self-hate and hopelessness about everything. And the reason why I'm bringing this is because most of the people, the way they respond to speed or to other amphetamine-based products such as Ritalin, Adderall, Vyvanse, especially Ritalin and Adderall, is that they have that massive anxiety on the next day. Surprisingly, I never had to deal with any of that stuff. I had to deal with some other stuff. In best case scenario, which were probably not more than 5% of the time, eating and sleeping were simply not possible for days. While struggling to fall asleep, I was making numerous attempts to warm myself up by putting so many blankets on me. Despite that, all of my limbs were staying cold as I spent some time in the freezer. In all of the other 95% of the time, all I wanted was to hide myself, cry and eventually get drunk to the point where I could pass out regardless of the large amounts of amphetamine in my system. Yes, I was crying a lot back then and those were not the verification tears I told you about during Dyke show hi. And now there was a lot of sobbing and a lot of noises and I was constantly trying to hide myself from the outer world because I was constantly crying. Actually not constantly but up to 10 or 12 times a day. I was getting so depressed that I simply did not want to live, to not even exist to disappear like I've never been born. No, it never made me suicidal, but only because I always thought about my mom and that she did not deserve that. Often I felt like I was such a horrible curse to her. There were a lot of guilt, remorse and regret. And I was also often asking myself why the fuck my mom had to have me as her child. Back to hating myself again, I was never concerned about me. And to a very big extent, the next sentence sums up exactly how I felt. I had holes in my mind and soul. Steady bleeding, they were lost in the sea of endless emptiness. I did not have anything to say nor to give to anyone. Completely useless, I felt like my whole existence was a total waste. And the next sentence describes how I felt in the rare cases when I was actually concerned about myself and my health. Knowing how damaging the substance was, I was guessing that the holes weren't only into my mind and soul, but there were probably some into my organs as well. Because as probably all of you guys already know, speed definitely puts holes into your organs, brain and into your whole body. 10 or 12 years younger than now, I felt sick, old and also very miserable. And I was also thinking about the worst case addicts and the fact that they were shooting it and that was scaring the shit out of me. And finally, achieving all of the beautiful dreams I had during the actual high no longer seemed possible, especially for a scumbag like me. So the only anxiety I had back then was about the cat. Deep inside me I knew that no matter what, she did not have to see the substance. Okay, that is exactly how I felt. I was doing whatever I was doing, but the cat did not have to see the substance by any means. The feel that someone or something else was watching me through her eyes was making me restless for days. Sometimes I thought it was the spirit of my mom's mother, aka the beloved grandma I already told you about when I was talking about cigarettes. Sometimes I felt it was God, the force or maybe a combination of them all. Whatever it was, I was sure it was good and it was there to protect me. I also knew that what I was doing back then was disappointing that thing massively. And because of that I warned all of my friends that the cat did not have to see the substance by any means. I also I also told them that otherwise I would break their hands. I was obsessed with that thing, it was some heavy OCD type of a thing. That is the best way I can describe it. That was the only anxiety I had back then and the cat never saw the substance. No, I did not stop liking the high. 
actually it was my favorite one. But the guilt, the regret, the remorse and the feel I was betraying my mother were chasing me for days and nights after I was using the substance. They were forming a cloud of enormous pain I was no longer willing to deal with. Quitting it felt like being out of terrible debt I did not want to continue paying. To stop risking and sacrificing for it were also things I desperately desired to do. To free myself from paying the massive tax of terrifying negative emotions I described. And now pay attention to the thing that I'm about to say. Regardless of how weaker the high was getting, I was still admiring my other version. I was simply no longer willing to stay inside me when the afterward effects were kicking in. I no longer wanted to be inside my body when that thing was happening. And I'm pretty sure that if not all of the people, at least most of the people who ever used that specific substance know exactly what I'm talking about. Plus that my turntable and mixer were calling me every time I thought about them. And back then that started happening more and more often. I also wanted to save some money in order to buy me second deck and I knew that that thing wouldn't be possible if I was spending my money on speed. Splitting my life path from the ones of my quote-unquote crew and especially from the one of my dear friend, the Swedish kid, made things so much easier. Truth to be told, he was my closest friend during my whole childhood and puberty. And for quite a while, I not only missed him, but the others as well. Yet, I was also completely aware that abstaining from speed would be so much more difficult if he was around me back then. So, right now guys, I will tell you all of the things which I believe separate that specific substance from everything else I've ever dealt with. When it comes to heavy abuse or addictions to substances and other stuff, that is probably the most unique thing I've ever saw. While with all of the others, I was more or less addicted to the actual drug or thing I was doing, with that one, things were very different. Yes, I craved weed and cigarettes. Yes, I was abusing the shit out of alcohol, porn and junk food. And yes, I had a period in my life when I was trying to have sex with every single female I was finding at least a bit physically attractive. Speed I adored like it was a real person or maybe some kind of a real being with whom I had such a unique relationship. The baddest and most exotic looking female who was turning me into my best version. So, in order to help you understand better guys, I'll tell you about an urban legend from the local area. All you probably already know that most of the people, or big percentage of the people, call the pill Smolly. You also know that a lot of people call the marijuana Mary Jane. So, in the local area, a lot of the kids were calling the speed Annie. Accordingly to the urban legend I've mentioned, Annie was older than us kids and she was something like a cougar or a milf. So when we were talking to each other with my friends and with the other kids, we were like, do you know where Annie is? Is Annie with you? Bring Annie with you? Let's find Annie. And basically it was all about Annie. So after a while I started having that butterfly effect in my stomach when I was talking about any with someone. Pretty much the same butterfly effect kids or teenagers experience or get in their stomachs when they have crush on someone in high school. Actually those were the same exact butterflies and very often the effect was even stronger. As long as I can remember I began to feel that way about any right around the same time when I also started looking forward to that moment of the actual high when I was experiencing what I previously described as an emotional orgasm slash ejaculation. That was the same exact moment of verification tears and climax of emotions because of how incredible about myself I felt. Probably because my mind started having that association thing, it was almost like I had that twisted perversion that any or the drug itself was making me ejaculate in that manner. Quitting it really did not feel like I was quitting an actual substance, drug or a thing I was doing. I rather felt like I signed a contract in which I declared I was giving up all of my inspiration, dreams, confidence, big portion of my social skills and probably all of my game skills. The way how I ultimately felt was like I was giving up the ability to be the person who back then I thought I always wanted to be. I also thought that being that person or simply feeling normal and comfortable in my own skin were things which would no longer be available to me. 
and to some extent I felt like I was breaking up with a real person that was firstly my other me and of course Annie. <laughs> it sounds pretty funny but back then it wasn't funny at all. I was constantly repeating to myself that I rather have my heart broken than the ones of my mother and the cat. Because during that period of my life I was still not giving a fuck about myself nor about my health. Regardless of how ridiculous it sounds, I would say that I was never really addicted to the drug itself, but to the person I was becoming when I was on it. Like I had massive male crush on that guy, my other version. The smell and taste I hated, I also never really cared about the goosebumps, the shivers, the waves or the electricity in my jaw. Yet I started getting very excited about all of those things because I knew they were predecessors of what was coming next. That was me becoming that other person who was fixing my whole life in a matter of few minutes. I was addicted to how my friends were looking at me when I was putting tacks on walls, scratching on my turntables or when I was sharing with them about the girls I was dating or when I was simply telling them about the glorious future when I would be a badass turntablist and many other things. Almost having sparkles in their eyes in those moments when we were together high their whole beings were screaming at me fuck yeah you are the shit and that was exactly what I was craving the most. Sometimes I even felt like they used to believe more in me than I used to believe in my own self. Probably because after all my self-doubt was still there regardless that the drug was convincing me else. And here I'll make clear that the opinions of my friends were extremely important to me and that was basically that whole recognition verification type of a thing I already told you about when I started talking about speed. Together we were the shit, doing our secret ritual we were buying ourselves shit load of speed and then we were going to my house where for entire nights I was scratching on my turntable while some of the other kids were doing graffiti sketches on my old notebooks. Here and there I was also doing a little bit of tax during the middle portion of the night but for the most part the others were doing graffiti sketches and I was scratching on my turntable you know. While staring at the stars on my balcony was when we were also enjoying some very deep conversations about our dreams, aspirations and the life in general. And finally the cat. She never saw the substance but she was always with us. We were doing what we were doing and then we were bringing the cat inside the room and we were staying together until the rest of the night. The cat was always eager to stay with us and on the other hand my friends were always like yo bring the cat inside the room and she was staying with us until the rest of the night and we were basically staying together. The cat was part of the crew. The substance played its own hero, the substance was important, but it wasn't the only thing. It was about that excitement on a different level. Not the substance by itself, but the substance as part of something else. The substance as part of something bigger. Yes, P definitely made me have a lot of beautiful dreams, but never really helped me getting a bit closer to turn even one of them into reality. Ultimately, it made me feel like I was spectacular when I really wasn't. It took me some time to understand the harsh truth that being spectacular actually has nothing to do with taking drugs, but with beating the shit out of your craft until you master it. And then using your skills to eventually create something rare, exotic and even exceptional. Long and difficult process which had to start somewhere. For me quitting speed and developing just a bit more realistic outlook about everything was a great starting point. My starting point. It didn't make me building the things that I wanted to build, which back then were only few actually. It also did not make me get rid of the things I hated, like school and some other stuff. It simply made me tolerate them better. It never made me start training in order to improve my physical appearance so I could have more options with the females I was dating. Instead it made me handle better the most boring conversations I've ever had just to have sex. And to a very big extent I also believe that it actually was making me to go against my nature due to the fact it was making me extremely sociable and extremely talkative and I was talking about my plans with people with whom I shouldn't. So regardless of the fact that I'm an introvert I do not believe that there is something wrong with being sociable and all of that stuff but to that extent it was definitely changing my personality. Basically that was the same such as the thing with the warm hair, the beard and the weed. Instead of making things happen and doing some real fly stuff, I was wasting my time on the streets talking about it 
feeding my ego with the comments of my so-called friends. I also noticed that in long term I actually became way more sad than I was before I started taking it. Obviously that was due to the fact that speed was fucking up my body's ability to produce dopamine naturally. During that period I also started asking myself some very unpleasant questions. After all, since I was that mighty and powerful, why I was living with the mentality that in order to make anything happen I had to take shit load of speed. And even then I probably still needed some external help from someone or something else. And I also think that that was going against my nature due to the fact that I I'm one of those people who really doesn't fuck with the idea of being in a situation or being in a position where I have to rely on something or someone else. Why when I was on it all of my goals and dreams were so close to me that I could almost grab them and hold them in my hand for a second. But when the afterward effects were kicking in I always felt like they were practically unachievable for a piece of shit like me. Because that was exactly how I felt about myself. Probably even worse. Like 100 times worse. Do you know why? Because all of those things were nothing more than illusions induced by the drug itself. Having all of those thoughts for weeks made me feel so miserable and empty that I cannot even explain it. Finally, I admitted to myself that all of it was one huge and very dangerous waste of time, money and energy. I quit speed without any real difficulties besides the feel that I would never be the shit again. That was the only challenging thing. I felt like I will never be the shit again, okay? Other than that, I did not have any real difficulties. Probably it would be different if I was smoking it or shooting it. Thank God I never ever did that to myself. Not knowing what was coming next, I felt extremely secure that that was basically the most difficult thing to quit and I no longer had any interest in weed and I was about to quit cigarettes in a moment, like in a month and I felt very secure because I couldn't even imagine what was coming next. I started messing with alcohol in 5th grade. Because of that same year I visited hospital twice. First time I got drunk on a school camp during the winter vacation of 5th grade. In the beginning I was drinking occasionally but as the time passed by things quickly changed. As a 7th grader I had another quote unquote best friend with whom we were getting drunk very often. Binging on red wine was something we were doing in school several times during the course of the week. Side note, back then I still couldn't handle the taste of the heavy liquor. During the summer vacation between 7th and 8th grade the wine was replaced by a mix of brandy and Mountain Dew. Getting drunk during the middle portion of the day and going on a double dates like online dating was the thing back then and this time I had another quote unquote friend with whom I was doing that thing. My desire to drink alcohol became weaker as soon as weed started dominating the spectrum of substances I was using. Regardless of that I was still doing it here and there, mostly beer it was up to one gallon. As I previously said, dating seemed not possible when I was smoking weed. Yet my heavy sex addiction never cared about that, therefore sneaking few drinking days here and there was a necessity in order to get the whole dating thing going. As I've already told you, I had self-doubt even when I had to go to the toilet, the place where my confidence and self-esteem usually were. But all of that had zero importance when I was drunk. Side note, while speed was entirely eliminating my social anxiety, self-doubt and lack of confidence, alcohol was simply making me to not give a fuck about them. In my book of rules, dating and alcohol were always together, like they were best friends. Actually, they were even more, because without alcohol there was no dating. So the second was something like a byproduct of the first. But after I found speed I made a correction and then I made another correction after finding out that I couldn't use my dick for anything else besides pissing when I was on it. It wasn't like I was not able to maintain my erections, okay? I simply did not have any erections on speed. 
It seemed like Annie was never willing to share me with another female. And then I left Speed only for dates which I already knew wouldn't include any form of intimate contacts. Ones which required for me to be a bit more sociable and maybe engage in the conversation I wasn't necessarily enjoying. 16 or 17 years old, that was the time when I got my first PC and that was also the time when I started to heavily or strongly participate in the mindless rat race I'm talking about in my four years of no fap experience video. The mindless rat race in which most of the men, probably up to 95% of the men on this planet participate. It is all about having more sex and being with more women than the next guy. Please don't get me wrong, sex was extremely important but what was also equally important was the whole idea that I was able to tell my friends that I had sex on the previous day. Searching for girls on the internet was something I was doing very often during all of those long nights when I wasn't able to fall asleep because of obvious reasons. Back then I really did not care about the women's personality. The way I was looking on the females in general was only as potential or non-potential intimate partners. But in the end of the day, since there was virtually no dating without speed and alcohol, I came up with a plain schedule I strictly followed. So, because it was online dating, most of the time the first dates were all about getting to know each other and yara yara yara. The second dates were basically the same thing and on the third date I was either bringing the girl into my house or she was bringing me into her house. When I got 18 I also started visiting hotels and on some rare occasions I was getting hit in the local park. And I had the perfect idea which was the exact substance I had to use on all of those dates in order to keep the whole dating thing going. As long as I can remember, the plan schedule was something like that. First date, no sex, definitely speed. Second date, no sex, most definitely speed again. Third date, alcohol, but not too much until I was done with the intimate contacts, because that was again interfering my erections. And it was also making me pissing non-stop basically. So, okay guys, the way I'm going to proceed now is by telling you another real life story and this real life story is all about alcohol. Because of that, I want to make clear that at least two weeks prior to the day when that thing happened, I haven't been using any speed and I also haven't been using any weed. So keep that in mind. One day I got drunk and I asked the kid to give me his bike so I could do a circle in the local park with it. He told me that he felt like it wasn't really a good idea but I insisted. Ultimately everything ended with an accident with me and the woman who in that moment was also in the same park. Thank god nothing bad happened, thank god no one got injured but I had some bad bruises for close to a month. End of the story. It was still the end of 2007, few months after I quit speed and probably a bit less time after I quit cigarettes. Remember what I described as the afterward effects of taking speed? That was not only exactly how I felt most of the time, but it was getting worse during the afternoon. And because I was constantly depressed, there was a lot of crying as well and that time it felt worse than ever. I felt extremely empty and also very lonely. Please don't get me wrong, I'm an introvert, with or without drugs, I really enjoy being alone, staying alone, basically spending time on my own, doing things on my own. I am not fuck with too many people and I always keep my circle close, actually closer. But that was the only time in my whole life when that thing appeared as a problem and I felt lonely. A lot of it was caused due to the fact that big part of me was still missing what was happening during the summer and spring of 2007. And I'm not talking about the speed by itself, but about that whole excitement on a different level. It was my last year in high school. In order to graduate faster, I was taking the total number of exams I had for close to two years for one because I wanted to get rid of school as quick as I possibly could. Things were kind of normal during the day, but around 5 p.m. my depression and along with that my need for alcohol drinking were getting unbearably stronger. Sometimes I even wanted to start drinking right after lunch. The only thing which had the power to keep me sober during the entire day was my desire to get better at scratching. 
alcohol was completely destroying my coordination and I wasn't able to practice after drinking it. Probably due to the fact it was dehydrating my whole system and body, in my imagination booze was making my blood dry. That was exactly how I felt about it. It was making my blood dry, therefore my fingers and hands were getting stiff and I couldn't scratch. For the most part I was managing to hold myself during the entire day but being sober during afternoon was simply not an option. At that point drinking up to one gallon of beer on one sitting was not something new to me. It was simply no longer enough. The solution was to start pouring some heavy liquor into my beer. The type of a liquor I was typically using was either gin or red rum. Skipping a day of drinking was making me completely unable to fall asleep at night and getting wasted on my own was something I was doing on a day to day basis. Regardless that I never had a memory of what happened on the previous day, two things were always sure upon awakening. Firstly, I had to apologize to my mom and after that I had to do the same to some other people. Just in case you wonder, excluding in few cases, alcohol never made me aggressive. I simply had an awful behavior. Yet, one of those cases caused me the scars above my forehead I will probably have until the rest of my life. But we are going to talk about that thing in a moment. Sometimes I was having dinner with my family and after they were falling asleep, I was sneaking out of the house, I was buying me some liquor late night and I was getting wasted on my own. Meanwhile, my parents went on a vacation for the New Year's Eve. That was the New Year's Eve between 2007 and 2008. I got so wasted that I slept for close to 28 hours. After I woke up, I called some homies and asked them what happened and they told me that I slept for 30 hours straight. In that moment, I felt some enormous pain in all of my organs, like they've been stabbed with some kind of blades or something. Scared to death, I called that girl I was constantly convincing to fuck me. I asked her to come and stay with me until my parents were home and I promised her that I wouldn't do any attempts of getting her having sex with me because I was already scared that I was about to die. Literally. And here guys, I'll also tell you that it wasn't a single time when a very dear back then to me person had to drive me back home because I was simply not able to walk, talk, nor move. I was not able to do anything because of alcohol. It was still the end of 2007. I heard that there would be a national DMC competition in the local area and I wanted to compete so bad that probably you cannot even imagine. In the end of the day, that was the beginning of all of those dreams I had when I was turned up to the maximum on speed. Or maybe I should say that doing good in it was one of those things about which I dreamed of pretty much all of the times when I was wired as a motherfucker. In order to be able to dedicate my full attention to the preparation for that battle, I had to get rid of school the fastest possible way. Therefore, I had to motivate the shit out of my ass and graduate immediately and that was exactly what I've done. Side note, spending even a single cent on the school's prom was something I refused to do by any means. Regardless of the fact that I changed 5 public and 1 private, I never started fucking with it. And even though that I had plenty of experience with it, on or off drugs, school never became my tank. But the weirdest thing was that in the moment when I no longer had to deal with it, my still existing cravings for speed became so much weaker. So, the way how I felt about my graduation and the whole school's prom in general was something like I would celebrate whenever I decide to, it would be my own way and nothing school related would be part of it. Another side note, do you know what else never became my thing? I'll tell you what, partying. Partying I always hated. Even during my worst period, partying was never the thing that I would want to do. Sex I adored, drugs I adored, alcohol, I wouldn't say I adored it, but I was abusing the shit out of it, partying I always hated. My first professional turntables were Vestax, but due to the fact that the company was a sponsor of the whole competition for so many years, in those battles they were using only techniques. 
After hearing about the difference between the turntables I currently had and the ones used in those competitions, mom told me that it would be the best to reinvest the money from the prom in a brand new pair of Technics 1200s. Even though I told her that wouldn't be necessary, she insisted and that was exactly what we've done ultimately. Honestly, I really can't explain you how happy I was when I went to the local gear store to buy my first pair of Technics turntables. Actually, the smell of fresh Technics turntables is unforgettable. They have that specific smell. Scared shitless, I started prepping for my first real battle and appearance on stage. You got rid of school, now it's time to do the same thing with booze. It shouldn't be a problem since you already quit speed, weed and cigarettes. Those were the words I kept repeating to myself during that period of time. Yet, there was a problem and that was the fact that alcohol wasn't like anything else I previously dealt with. Making the simple decision to quit it was simply not enough and my addiction wasn't going anywhere. In fact, very often I felt like I was something like a puppet to it. And now I'm not so sure if there are people who can relate to the thing that I'm about to say, but with alcohol I actually had very well pronounced physical need to start drink alcohol after certain hours of the day, after 5 or 6 pm. Where I was feeling it was right here, in my throat. Again, I don't know if there are other people who can relate to what I'm saying, but alcohol was the only thing with which I was experiencing an actual physical need. Even though I surrendered quitting it for a while, I managed to do some adjustments to my horrible habit. Instead of starting at 5 or 6 p.m., I was no longer drinking before 9. That way, I was able to scratch for a few extra hours. Mostly sticking to beer, I also drastically reduced the heavier stuff. Getting drunk was still the way of how my days were ending, probably at least in 90% of the time. Getting wasted wasn't. Apologies were no longer required and I was able to remember everything on the next day. And you best believe that that was a huge step. My sixth sense was strongly suggesting me that doing good in the up and coming competition would make some major difference to me. At that point I wasn't sure what exactly, but thinking about it and also thinking about the art of scratch by itself was giving me an awesome and warm feel. Besides that, I also had to make sure that mom haven't spent all of that money for nothing. In the end of the day, she did that regardless of the fact that the person who happens to be my other biological parent told her that he would divorce her if she buy me tax. And on top of everything, she did that three times. The first time with my bell drive turntables, the second one with my Vestax and the third time with the Technics 1200s. Ultimately, I entered the competition and I got second. Probably it doesn't sound as much, but to me it changed more than I expected. It made me start caring about myself and my body because I was making things happen without the help of drugs. Instead of harming it, I wanted to protect my body because in the end of the day I needed it to work properly for the up and coming battle on the next year. It was the summer of 2008 and I purchased my first MacBook. A person brought it for me from the US but I had to pick it up from another city. Me and my closest friend with whom I was often scratching went there because he had to take care of some business and I had to pick up my laptop. I got the laptop and everything was fine until I got drunk. Then I stumbled on some rock while holding a bottle of beer in my hand. Obviously the bottle broke and the pieces of glass cut my hand. There was a lot of blood and I did not know where I was in that moment. Yet the worst thing was that there were some pieces of glass inside my hand. That and that big. While my friend was doing his tank, I was hanging with two girls. Both of them were hot as hell and they helped me to bandage my hand. While I was mostly talking to the first, the second was holding her gaze on me. With a smile and enthusiasm, she was responding to basically everything I was saying. And she was even like, no worries, the blood is not a problem. I actually even wipe blood, it is awesome. And she was telling me all of that stuff, basically. I was drunk as a motherfucker. I mean, not wasted, but drunk as a motherfucker. With a bandaged arm and blood on my oversized YT, I was like, yeah, whatever, noting after her while I really didn't care. 
back home with multiple pieces of grass inside my hand. My parents took me to the hospital where the doctors removed most of them. It was pretty painful because in order to do it, the doctors had to open the wound again. Before I left the place, the doctors also told me that I was such a lucky bastard because no important arteries were altered. Otherwise, they had to perform some surgery. While thinking of what just happened, I realized I was very close to saying goodbye to scratching. In that moment, I finally understood that my drinking was completely out of control and it was actually jeopardizing me seriously. In that moment, I also came to the conclusion that the blood liking girl, the second one, the one who was constantly responding to all of the things I was saying, was actually hotter than the other one. And probably she was fucking with me since she eagerly responded to every single bullshit I said. At that point I understood how far things have actually gone and also how stupid and blind I was to underestimate the dangers of probably the most life-threatening to me drug I've ever used, once again. And also how stupid and blind I was to underestimate the dangers of probably the most life-threatening to me drug I've ever used, alcohol. Then my mind started projecting some episodes from my past. The two visitations I had to the hospital in 5th grade because of it. All of the times when it made me, if not completely unconscious, at least not knowing where I was in that specific moment. The time when I couldn't wake up for close to 30 hours. All of the others, which I would probably never remember. The accident with the bicycle and the woman in the park. The numerous cases when it made me puking while having cold sweat all over my body. The scars on my forehead which I got into a street fight with a fat motherfucker who is no longer alive. Yes, that was one of those cases when alcohol besides everything else also made me aggressive. All of them because of what? Because of my stupidity. To dare to believe that since something was not only legal and largely available, but also heavily promoted, then it couldn't be that bad and dangerous after all. Until that moment I used to believe that the more I loved a specific substance, the more difficult it would be for me to quit it. Yet my mentality was wrong. I needed to continue drinking beyond the point where I was no longer fucking with it, okay? I really no longer wanted to get drunk the last times, okay? I simply had that need after specific hour of the day. This moment of truth made me have my first entirely sober days. I mean whole 24 hours and not just abstaining from it until night time. Abstaining from it for a whole day was actually way more difficult than I thought it could possibly be. In fact, it took me close to few months to be able to maintain few consecutive sober days. No, I've never been into any kind of rehab nor program for heavy drug or alcohol abusers. What was helping me the most was firstly my passion for scratching and secondly my goal of not disappointing mom and ultimately winning the up and coming DMC. To a very big extent everything felt like it was a mission or something similar and honestly I believe that it certainly was. Getting better at scratching was not only making me more confident but for the first time I actually started liking myself. I mean I really started enjoying being that person who was able to do all of those techniques I was learning back then. Please don't get me wrong, all of those techniques, they weren't advanced techniques, they weren't anything spectacular. I would not use any of those techniques nowadays, neither in my routines, neither in my music, but back then they had such an important value to me. True to be told, I felt amazing when I was learning every single one of them. The more techniques I was learning, the better I felt about myself, so the more I wanted to stay on the right path. And of course, the longer I was staying sober, the more techniques I was learning. The perception I had about myself drastically changed. After all, I couldn't be that bad since I was able to do all of those scratches. For close to one year, I had some devilish thirst to maybe let it loose and have just few drinks. It was chasing me pretty much all of the time on all sorts of places, especially after that time of the day, after 5 or 6 pm. Many things were making it stronger, those were the alcohol commercials, the liquor bottles in the grocery stores and also other people who were drinking. 
Keeping my mind preoccupied with scratching was my way of bypassing all of them. No, it wasn't like I never got drunk again, but it was getting less and less frequent, like few times a month it was only beer and on the next day I was remembering everything. Yet for quite a while there was a voice at the back of my head who kept telling me that quitting booze entirely wasn't really a good idea because intimate contacts would not be possible without it. As a hardcore sex addict I was really concerned about it but after a while I started reminding myself what pretty much all of the females and especially all the hardest females with whom I slept with back then were always telling me after having sex with me. So basically all of them were telling me that they were really not fucking with my excessive amounts of flesh and male titties. They were fucking with like muscular guys, with toned bodies, V tapers, visible abs, smaller waists and all that good stuff. Because of that deep inside me I knew that I would not really need drugs nor alcohol in order to get the whole dating thing going if I managed to build a decent or a good physique. And by decent or good physique I am really not referring to competitive bodybuilder type of a look or a physique athlete type of a look or a fitness model type of a look. I am mostly talking about making people turn heads when you are in public type of a look. At that point I also already wanted to start messing with bodybuilding. Firstly because I have always admired the look of legends like Arnold and Serge Nubre and secondly because I really wanted to exchange the male titties and the excessive amounts of flesh for some muscle mass and flat stomach. The only problem was that I was still lacking confidence and I felt like the more advanced lifters they would make fun of me because I had those male titties, because I was chubby, obese, whatever you prefer to call it. Ultimately the competition came, I entered and I won it. Again that probably doesn't sound as much but to me it made so much of a difference because it opened huge gap between me and my whole past. At that point there was no longer something which could prevent me from start visiting a gym and also doing all of those things which until back then seemed as unavailable to me. Already knowing that besides everything alcohol was also making me fat I figured out that it could prevent me from getting cleaner and making the gains I wanted. And then I started visiting a gym and that put my drinking to an end. When I got serious with fitness, with bodybuilding, I stopped drinking entirely. Scratching not only played major role when I was quitting speed, but it was the main reason why I quit alcohol. Technically it became the beginning of my self-help journey or my introduction to the world of personal development slash self-improvement. Ever since then I never stopped improving myself as turntablist and as many other things which becoming better at scratching made available to me. It was the fastest and most essential way for me to figure out how to start channeling all of my emotions. For example, the deep love I felt and still feel for my mom, the cat and of course the art form itself and also some negative ones for my previous versions as human being and for my past in general. How to pull myself towards the first three or towards some other goals that I have while simultaneously with that pushing myself from the last two or against the last two. If you are a fan of Star Wars then undoubtedly you are familiar with the code of the Sith. Peace is a lie, there is only passion. Through passion I gain strength, through strength I gain power, through power I gain victory. Through victory my chains are broken, the force shall free me. My passion not only helped me break the chains of my addictions but also to destroy the inner prison made out of the wrong perception I had for the outer world. It opened my eyes and showed me that the same perception was not only highly influenced by my own fears and insecurities but also by the fact that I was looking down on me for so many years. Based on my personal experience I can easily tell you that bodybuilding can be second to none when it comes to achieving all of those things. I immediately felt in love with it in the moment I stepped in the gym for the first time. But before that I simply felt like I was not good enough and I also thought that the more advanced lifters they would probably make fun of me. In other words I simply needed something else to make me feel good in my own skin. 
okay? I simply needed to start feeling normal in my own skin in order to start messing with bodybuilding, lifting weights and all of that great stuff. So scratching provided that. To me, every addiction has multiple layers or multiple aspects and taking the actual substance or doing the actual thing is only one of them. Honestly, I believe that what kept my addictions going for so long weren't only the drugs by themselves, but the person who I was and the lifestyle I had. That included all of the daily habits and routines I had, the way of thinking I had, the people with whom I was hanging, what was going on inside my household, the school, the dad that I had, the fact that I was never exercising, the fact that I was so ignorant for that many years and the fact that I was already constantly wasting my sexual energy way before I started smoking cigarettes. I also think that all of my addictions were nothing more than sure signs that I was missing something deep inside me and in fact I do not believe it was a single but many things like for example self-love, self-value, confidence, joy, excitement, feel of security and of course real purpose in life. The things which were presented as alternatives to the drugs were either no good or simply not enough to me. I needed something more. I needed something to excite the shit out of me and ignite my desire to sacrifice now for later so I could go through the whole transformation process of becoming a new person. Quitting this or that substance was no longer my goal, I rather started taking that as a fundamental part of something bigger. I no longer wanted to continue ending up in the same situations over and over again, but I knew that I had to work on all areas of my life. I not only wanted to stop taking drugs, but to change my whole entity. To me there is no doubt that not only the drug addictions, but all of the addictions I had were connected with each other and that all of the ones I already had massively contributed to the development of the next ones. However, even though they were a big part of it, I really do not believe that that whole process of self-destruction started with drugs. I believe it started with my whole lifestyle, especially with my dad and with the fact that I was already wasting my sexual energy. Just in case you want to find out more about the second, I will suggest you to watch my 4 years of NoFap experience video and I will leave a link for that video in the description box down below. Yes, I had some other issues as well, but those were things I couldn't really control back then, yet I believe I would be able to handle all of them way better if it wasn't about the two things I've mentioned. Honestly, I think that all of those things formed the real reason why I started searching for happiness and satisfaction on the wrong places. To me by themselves, not a specific substance nor even a habit are the root of all evil, but the ignorance of the masses and all of the misleading information that is spread out there. No, I'm not saying that a self-destructive habit is something different than what it is. I'm simply suggesting that it could be and very often is byproduct of one or multiple things which have already been part of the person's lifestyle for so many years in a row. And that person actually has absolutely no idea about the negative effects those things produce on his or her whole well-being. Maybe if more people are aware that some of the things they do or eat on a day-to-day -day basis are making them less satisfied and happy, unconfident, indecisive, unmotivated, uninspired, fat, sad and ultimately stupid, they would probably firstly try to avoid all of those things instead of searching for a quick fix elsewhere. Or in other words, if the people knew that the lifestyle they currently have is exactly what is making them feel like shit, they would probably firstly try to improve that lifestyle instead of using drugs. As I've already mentioned guys, I've been into 6 schools, 5 public and 1 private, but surprisingly none of the following things was a part of any of those schools curriculum. How the different micronutrients affect the human biology? What are the damaging effects of the junk food? What is the habit of photo suggestion and how it could and should be used? How porn and masturbation affect the human brain? What is the sexual energy and how people could and should use it to become better at life? Napoleon Hill's teachings. No, I'm definitely not proud that I did all of the things I told you about in this video, but I'm also certainly not indifferent 
to the experience I gained because I believe that it really helped me later in my life when I was quitting my addictions to orgasms, porn, masturbation and junk food. And now pay attention to the thing that I'm about to say because it is based on the experience I gained since I've been born. I would say that the shittier lifestyle someone has, the more impressive to that person drug scene. I came to that conclusion back in the summer of 2014 when for the first time I experienced all of the amazing benefits of the combination of NoFap, cyclical celibacy, eating mostly ketogenic diet in not more than one meal per day while exercising daily, often twice a day and creating the type of stuff I always wanted to create. Right around the same time I also found that things like eating junk food or simply eating the wrong foods and having too many orgasms due to overindulgence in the habit of sex even when I stay on NoFap can easily make me feel very close to the way how I used to feel on the next day after doing speed. The feel I'm getting nowadays because of all of the things I've mentioned I would describe as very close to the feel most of the people want to get from the usage of nootropics and heavy stimulants. In fact, to me personally, it is even better because first of all, it's a lot cleaner, second of all, there are no side effects, and third, it is permanent, it is steady. That is the exact way how I feel all of the time. There is no mental nor physical rush whatsoever, but there is also no price to be paid on the next day. To me, there is no doubt that my brain simply hates to be in a position or in a situation where it has been forced to burn neurotransmitters faster than it typically does. And as probably many of you guys already know, that is exactly what creates those rushes and that is also exactly what depletes certain micronutrients inside your body. To me, that thing equals side effects, anxiety and or depression. Another extremely important thing which I learned back then is the fact that it really doesn't matter how emotional I get, but what part of those emotions I'm gonna be able to channel and ultimately put in good use. Or in other words, how to transform my thoughts into actions so I could achieve some goal of mine or turn a dream of mine into reality. And finally, the last thing that I want to say in this video, guys, is something in regards to probably the biggest excuse of why people do drugs. So, a lot of the people, they say they do drugs because drugs make them feel more of themselves. And certainly that was one of my main reasons why I was abusing the shit out of one of those substances I've already told you about. But the most of myself I've ever felt wasn't when I was high on drugs. The most of myself I've ever felt was when I started implementing all of those things I told you about, okay? And another thing that I want to say as an addition to this is that when I was high on drugs it was all about searching for that verification slash recognition from the outer world, either from my friends, either from someone else. Now I have even stronger drive, I'm even more inspired more motivated but it is all about dazzling and impressing one person and one person only and that is me almost like looking inward i also noticed that the longer i sustain that lifestyle the stronger that feel is getting and especially when i'm using it to create the things that i want in those and in many other cases i often feel bursts of inexplicable euphoria. I take advantage of that euphoria to get something done and then I feel incredible. So yeah guys, that was basically everything I wanted to say and show you in this video. I hope you like it. If so, please do not hesitate and click on the thumbs up button down below. Maybe subscribe to my YouTube channel for more content. And yeah, I'm gonna wrap it up for now. Please stay tuned for more. Have a nice one. Peace and I'm out, don't do drugs, and as always, keep flexing. Peace.